Welcome to this week's lecture on the child. So we've um, kind of introduced Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological model. We've looked at some of our agents of socialization, and now we are going to look at the middle, which is the child. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at some child development and some milestones that we might generally need to know about, what temperament types we might have and what they are, um, and personality as well. So once again, we are looking at the very, very middle, which is the developing person, the individual, or because this is a child socialization class, the child. What we would want to know about the child is typically their age, because that might give us some good information about their developmental ability, um, maybe what gender they identify with, what um, ability level they have, like maybe special needs or not, their health, um, if they're in the hospital a lot, if they're in good health, um, they may be struggling with their health. And then we also want to know about their personality and their temperament. So that's the beginning. We've looked at agents of socialization. We've looked at the system as a whole. And now we're starting with the very, very beginning at the very middle. So within milestones and development, what we generally call a milestone is when children follow a similar trajectory for both growth and development. So in development, we typically have physical, cognitive, and our social emotional domains. Within that we have, within physical, we have motor skills, um, gross motor, which is running and kicking and jumping. And then we have fine motor skills, which is like being able to um, pick a phone up or uh, work with um, anything with our hands. Um, so within those areas, we are measuring children's development because we want to give them the best start, the best potential. Um, so we are doing um, some work with development and growth to make sure that physically you are growing and you are healthy. Any kind of delay could impact how the child is socialized, how they um, interact. We want to make sure they reach their full potential, so getting intervention so that they can learn and grow generally at the same time as other people. So that's similar trajectory for growth and development. So um, an example of a milestone, this might be something that you might get from your um, uh, pediatrician's office or somewhere like that. So it generally talks about um, from a newborn to three years old, what kind of um, physical milestones we might see. So this is a similar trajectory. So around um, by um, around nine months is when babies start crying crying. They're always crying. That's how they communicate and tell us what's going on. They start crawling. So about nine months. They have up into a year. They take them a while. They're a little bit slow. That's totally fine. Anything before a year is totally a milestone. That's fine. And then typically around a year, but up to 18 months, children are learning how to walk. So that would be an example of a developmental milestone. Generally, we want to see children crawling around nine months and walking at a, a year to 18 months, so a year to a year and a half. Um, after that, if they stopped, if they didn't walk at a year and a half or two years old, we might consider that a delay and we might get a physical therapist who can help support them in their muscle tone and being able to walk and help the parents encourage that. So this is um, also typical development and this is a milestone as well. So right here on the left hand side, this is pretty typical at 10 months. So a child will hold something like um, this at about 10 months old, and we call that the pincer grasp. Um, then when they are older as well, uh, we'll have about um, a little after a year, it's very typical for a child to hold a pencil like this and scribble like this. Um, once they're like two to three, they're starting to use their fingers like this and writing as well. Um, and then at three to four, we're looking at a quadrupeds. They're still using a few pictures. And then at five to six, we've got more of like the tripod or adult grip that we're looking for. So that would be an example of development or your milestones um, in being able to grasp or hold objects all the way from 10 months right here, all the way to about five years old. Atypical development um, can kind of tell us that milestones are not being met. There might be um, delays in a skill, like holding a pencil, um, in knowledge, so your ability to cognitively understand things like intelligence. And assessment and evaluation is just to set up treatment so that you can get that support um, from people like me. I used to do this. I was an early interventionist, so I helped infants and toddlers with special needs. So if they had Down syndrome, a speech delay, uh, maybe they were on the autism spectrum, we were there to help and support them um, so that they could start to get those uh, milestones and increase their development. 
Um, so what um, I think a great thing to do um, and what I would encourage all of you is just right after this, you're already online, just Google a milestone um, and its importance. Um, and that is a fantastic way uh, to just generally um, start to look at um, children. So you could do like um, three to six months old. Um, what are milestones? If you Google that, it will show you right away what you would expect in the three to six month old and their milestones. Um, and I think that might be a great way for you at home to kind of understand how milestones might change. Um, and we're so lucky with Pinterest, Google Images, that you can, and even YouTube, uh, where you can see those types of differences. So I would highly recommend you guys in doing that. Um, in special needs and differing abilities as well, um, we want to um, set up those services, make those changes to support, uh, because a significant delay that's not helped and supported um, is going to impact um, the education of the child, their socialization, and then as they're adults, their ability to learn and grow as well. So it's something we want to start as early as possible when a brain is more malleable in the first five years of life is when most of our brain development is happening. So if we can have a lot of intervention start soon, then children can play catch up and they might ne not necessarily need help as adults. So we're now going to segue into the child, the temperament, and the personality. And once again, the great thing about being an online learner is um, I'm talking generally through these, but you can always stop, pause, go back if you need to take more notes, or even go back on a separate day um, and watch this throughout the class if you need more help. So if I was teaching in person, it would be a little bit slower. But in this case, you have that flexibility to rewind, to fast forward, um, to come back at different times in order to kind of hear my words about specific things. So what we're kind of looking for is that individual again. Um, and we are looking at how we act and how we respond to relationships with people, how we respond to our community and our environment, and how we respond to our society. So all of that is how we are socialized. So socialization happens to us and we also happen to it. So depending on our ability level, our gender roles, our age, that's going to impact the relationships that we structure with other people, the um, ways that we can inter um, interact with our environment, so physically what is actually around us, and our culture and our religion um, and larger issues like that. So I would also um, highly suggest that you guys do a personality test. So I made a tiny URL for um, a 16 personalities personality test. Um, so that might be really fun if you've ever kind of wanted to know more about yourself, if you find astrology and star signs um, really interesting. Um, this is a, a great one. It takes about five minutes. Um, it'll give you more information about you personally and who you are. I like taking those. You could do an Enneagram. You could do a Myers-Briggs. There's lots of personality tests out there and they're fantastic um, and this might help you um, because part of this class is a process of reflection on yourself understanding who you are so that you can also understand who other individuals are as well um, so a child's personality or temperament are going to affect that bonding and attachment that they receive from their microsystem so their family the bonding and attachment they get from their family their friends their school, um, their community, um, and um, also the way that they might interact with their media um, because of their personality, how much are they wanting to read, to sit down, things like that as well. Um, so it's going to um, impact that care that they receive from the school, community, society, parents, peers as well. So we have generally three temperament types. Um, and there are the three Fs, although I, I've renamed this one. So we have flexible and we have feisty, which I think are good descriptors. This is fearful, but which a lot of times I consider slow to warm up because I feel like fearful might have like a negative connotation and it's not a negative thing generally. Um, it's just how you approach your environment. So these three temperament types are um, how you use your five senses. So your... Um, your, uh, how you see, how you hear, how you taste, how you touch, um, hear, touch, taste, feel, see, I think I got all of them, um, but it's how you use those five senses in your environment. So um, if, if are things generally overwhelming to you or not, how do you respond to those around you? So flexible is like that stereotypical, super mellow, laid back, easy person. They're typically very regular. They go to bed. They don't have trouble sleeping. They're very adaptable to new things. If everybody's going out to eat, uh, whatever anybody else picks is fine with them. Um, if they go to an ice cream store, 
odd. They're having a hard time deciding because all of the flavors taste great. Um, they're not very intense. They're not very sensitive to things around them. So if you took a flexible child to Disneyland, they would they could stay all day, 16 hours, 12 hours with you walking around, looking at everything, um, going on the ride. They're going to wait well in line. That might be the flexible child at Disneyland. The slow to warm up child adapts slowly, withdraws, might be overstimulated or overexcited or um, have a hard time. This child at Disneyland is going to take some time to warm up. They might not be able to hang as long during the day or, you know, you might have to leave, go to a hotel, come back. They might zonk out in the stroller and need to take a long nap. They might need to uh, spend some time out um, and about in like a, a a less crowded area, like all the noise, all the lights, all the music and sound and other people is too much. They might need to take a, a break on a park bench in the shade and just kind of relax and decompress. And then feisty, uh, which is like a big personality. And I'm, I'm a pretty feisty person. So there's the, none of these are good or bad. They are just who you are. And you could be a mixture of them as well. Um, so you could, I'm typically um, fairly active. I like to um, be up and I'm a morning person and doing things. Um, they typically have intense reactions to things. They're very happy, very sad, very mad. Uh, they're easily distractible, which is totally me. Um, I do my videos in front of a bright window um, so that I have sunlight so you can actually see my face. Um, but sometimes it's hard because um, you know I'll see a bird or you know something like that and you know my, my kind of ADHD side, uh, well, I'll be distracted when I'll look up. Um, cause I'm, I'm a bit, um, feisty sensitive as well. So sensitive to people around you, sensory is around, uh, around you, but you might also seek it out too. So this child is typically like loving Disneyland until they hate it. <laughs> um, so this is the child, um, that, it, you know, hits the ground running, um, is on all, like loves all the, the roller coasters and things like that. Um, and then might hit the wall, hangry, feed them now, temper tantrum, um, because it's just too much and they're hungry and they've been, you know, they've been doing so much. So those are our three temperament types. So remember in the middle of Yuri Brothenbrenner's ecological theory is you at the beginning, you in the middle. So whatever temperament type you are or the child you're working with is, that temperament type is part of their age, their gender, their ability, because this is going to impact how other people give them care. You're not going to treat a fearful child the same way you are a feisty child at school. The fearful child um, maybe is going to take a long time. They're slow to warm up. It's going to take them a long time to feel comfortable with you as the teacher or you with other people or they cry because they want mom to come back. Even though they're having fun, they still don't want to say goodbye. Whereas the feisty child might enter the classroom really confident. Um, they might um, have lots of questions. They might be the one that wants to help everybody else out. Um, and then they might also be the one that might fight with somebody um, or have a difficulty sharing as well. So we have to know that all of these temperament types are totally okay. We just have to know that that's also going to change um, how children are and how they um, are socialized by others. This is an example, this is a video that shows you temperament types in infants and young children. I talked about it, but I want to show it to you a little bit as well. Some children tend to make reactions as Some All right, 
So um, that was flexible and now we're gonna do it. And I'm sorry, that was <laughs> um, feisty and now we're looking at the flexible one.
All right, so I really, really hope that that helped you um, get some information and see the temperament types for children. Um, so you can see how they need different things from their caregivers. That's part of our responsive caregiving we were talking about in a previous video, is that it should be tailored to the needs of the child. You're the adult, you can more easily change um, to meet those needs than a child can because a child is little and new to this world um, and just learning how to do things. And you as a parent are gonna have children that are going to most likely have different temperaments if you have more than one. And in a classroom, you are going to have all of the temperaments and all of the mixes. Um, so this is that goodness of fit. So a temperament and a parent need to fit well together. Um, so this could be your family and your caregivers, even your, the way your environment is set up, um, and even transitions from like one thing to another. So like a slow to warm up child is gonna need more time to wind down one activity and get to another or to wind down in order to take a, a nap. So it's the temperament between the child and their environment and that responsive caregiving is what we want. So a feisty child and a slow to warm up child are going to need two different things um, from their caregivers as far as routines, as far as change, as far as their classroom, as far as activities, um, and within a family as well. So we have the ultimate responsibility in order to change that to meet the needs of the child. We were looking at our one of our theorists that you might have learned about if you took a child growth and development. We have this guy right here called Eric Erickson. I don't know why his parents named him Eric Erickson. Um, that would be like my name being Julie Julison. Um, but there we go. Um, he has a bunch of stages for learning how to be social emotional. And the first one when we're all young is trust versus trust trust versus mistrust. So we want children to have trust. They're picked up when they're sad, if they're comforted, if they're fed, if they have enough food in their house, if their parents listen to them and play to them. Um, so if they have caring relationships, then they're generally going to learn to trust people around them. If um, your needs are not met, if you often go hungry, if you're neglected or abused, or you don't have people close in your life that you form relationships with, you can then have mistrust. Um, and if you have mistrust, you might generally um, form attachments that are not based on trust. So you feel generally not comfortable um, forming attachment or relationships because you're not sure if that person is going to hurt you or not provide for you. So attachment is also something that we want to look at as well. Um, so this is being able to um, kind of understand um, that you are attaching to somebody else. Um, and we have just a few types that I'm not going to ask about, but just generally this was, these were the two theorists, John Bowlby and then Mary Ainsworth up here. Um, who are helping us kind of understand stranger anxiety, separation anxiety, trust, relationships, and how important it is to have attachment with somebody else. Um, so that was, um, this is, uh, I'm not going to play it for you guys, but attachment is important. And attachment really is just the way that we look at bonding um, and maybe love, responsive caregiving, holding a child, reading to a child, having conversations with a child, uh, providing food, nutrition, a warm place to live, all of that with the child as well. Um, so once again, we're looking at this child and they're looking at their temperament, which we've just gone over. We're looking at their need for trust and attachment. And we're looking at some other things specifically about that child. Um, and then we can also look at how an individual child interacts with their microsystem and their family around them. Um, so I just picked Jojo because my eight year olds are obsessed with Jojo. Um, if you don't know who Jojo is, if you're lucky, no. Um, Georgia's great. She she has a good message. It's about kindness and helping people. But she was a child star on a like a on a cable show, uh, Dance Moms, I think. Um, and now she's a YouTube sensation. She sings and has bows that you can buy. And she makes I think she made like eleven million dollars last year. She's like sixteen or seventeen years old. Um, but this is just an example to give you to understand how we might look at somebody. So last time or two weeks ago, we did it with Kim Kardashian, and we were just kind of 
of generally looking at Kim in the middle to kind of understand the system as a whole. Same with Jojo. So she's an adolescent. She's probably generation Y, I think. Um, she has a, a family um, that helps her with all her business. She has a mom, a dad, and a brother. She's from Texas. Um, so we're learning about her and her microsystem. And we're learning her, her friends are, she doesn't go to school, I don't think anymore. I think she's home tutored so that she can work on her YouTube videos and her music videos and all that type of stuff. Um, so she has a unique way of looking at the world. Um, and then in her community, having all that money once again. Um, I don't believe she li lives in Texas anymore. Um, I know a random amount about her once again because my eight-year-olds are obsessed. Um, she tours too, so she gets to travel more than maybe a 16 or 17-year-old is able to because she has like world tours or she performs her music. Um, she's probably, if we were going back to who she is, a feisty temperament. She performs, she's very friendly, outgoing, brash maybe as well. Um, and so she and her exosystem is having more um, availability to services and resources than the average child might. Um, and then maybe we could say something about her world and that she's white and um, she's professed to be a Christian. Um, she's from Texas, which definitely has their own kind of state cultural background. You know, people from Texas are like Californians. We're very proud of the state. You know, um, if anybody ever asked me, oh, are you American? I'm like, yeah, I'm a Californian. Uh, same with Texas, you know, God bless Texas, um, you know, the, the Longhorns or whatever. Um, so that might be part of her macro system is that larger sense of being a Texan um, and saying ma'am and sir and all that type of wonderful kind of manners that they have in Texas as well. So um, I wanted to just show this as a child that might be recognizable to you depending on how old you are and if you have kids in your life or not and just being able to see the child, see their temperament, see their personality and how that is affecting their microsystem, their meso, their exo, their macro and then their generational chrono or time one as well. Um, I'll just show you a little bit about Jojo just because you probably have never, <laughs> um, if you've never heard of you, you have no idea why I picked this child, but I think she has like 12 million subscribers on YouTube. Um, and she, once again, she makes a lot of money. And that's, that's Jojo. Um, and she generally has a message of kindness, um, sweetness, working with everybody. And she always wears um, a ponytail and this big bow. And that's, I think, where she makes most of her money because my daughter has one. Um, so if we were talking about her, we would talk about her age, her gender, her socioeconomic status, <laughs> which is probably rich, um, her temperament and personality. She probably has very trusting relationships. She seems to be very close with her mother in particular and her brother. Um, her temperament is most likely feisty. Uh, she seems to have a big outgoing um, intense personality um, what her microsystem would be would be more of her family um, the community might be a certain place in Texas or LA um, she might also have mezzo connections so connections between her school and her mom maybe her mom homeschools her because she doesn't go to school because she's working on her music videos um, so might have some mezzo connections for Jojo. Um, and then we might also have some information just generally about where she might also um, interact with her macro system, kind of being a Texan and things like that. So who the child is, and if we were looking once again back at Jojo, so who that child is, um, who her micro system is. Um, so if we're looking at her or any child in particular, um, that really affects the whole of your ecological model. So how the child interacts with these systems depends on somebody's temperament and their abilities as well. And this also can affect the responsive caregiving, the bonding and attachment that the child receives, and then also how they're treated and cared for in all of their systems as well. So that is it for today, and I will see you guys online.